Douglas's, so happy birthday, Doug. Uh, also, happy birthdays to Ann Boker and Kelly Kutowski, and happy anniversary to the Weinbergs. So, thank you very much. Um, and we've got flowers uh, in memory of Pete Henchman, given by Kate. Thank you very much for those. Some things to remind you of. Uh, lots of things going on here. So, the Mary Marthas are meeting on Monday, Bible study on Wednesday, the Chosen, if you want to come out for that, on Thursday. So, you should pick it out in the middle, can't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anytime. Anytime. So. Basically. Uh, also, want to, and Ron asked me to thank everyone for all the food, flowers, cards, concerns, uh, everything. everything. He, he said he'd never, he'd never make it through it, but but uh, big thank you to the church family for all your love and support. So, yeah. how's that? <laughs> all right. Good morning, everybody. So glad to be with you today, and with the Lord, it's a good day. Uh, we'll begin with the call to worship, which is responsive, and it should be on the screen if I put it there. Yes, I did. All right. I tell you this, it is a wonderful thing when members of the family live together in love and peace. May the church be one, just as Christ and God are one, that Christ may be glorified in us. They shall be your good fruit in this season, and their peace shall never wither. The grace, mercy, and peace of the Lord Jesus be with you all. And also with you. Please rise in body and spirit for the light of Christ's reading and prayer. Our light of Christ reading today comes from John 1, verses 1 through 5. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. Prayer. Everybody together. Mighty God in whom we know the power of redemption. You stand among us in the shadows of our time as we move through every sorrow and trial of this life. Uphold us with knowledge of the final morning when in the presence of your risen Son we will share in his resurrection, redeemed and restored to the fullness of life and forever free
welcomed us, so let us share the peace of Christ with friends and strangers with words of welcome. The peace of Christ be with you. Holy God, you have called us to follow in the way of your risen Son, and you care for those who are our companions, not only with words of comfort, but with acts of love. Seeking to be true friends of all, we offer our prayers on behalf of the church and of the world. So we pray this morning for Gloria for um, surgery on September 27th. Yes, that's for you. All right, Lord, we lift this prayer that, that Gloria will be well and fully recovered after her surgery and um, that we, uh, we can have our thoughts and our prayers with her and um, be moved to give any help that she requires after the surgery and be ill as well, give him patience and, and uh, hope that she'll recover just fine and um, we'll all be with them as they go through this time. And also for Ron and Kathy Lance, please continue to be with the two of them and with their family as they struggle through um, some life changes and, and health changes and all of those things that, that are challenges to us in this life, Lord. And also for um, Artie Off, his recovery. And also for everyone else in our congregation who is struggling with any kind of whatever. There are so many things in the world right now that, that we could be suffering from. Illness, financial difficulty, job loss, too much job, not enough job, uh, kids with problems, problems with school, all of these things are affecting the people in our community and in our congregation. So I want to lift those things to you, Lord, and, and give them to you and, and and have you help us to solve all those things in the best ways that we can. Guide us in the path of discipleship so that as you have blessed us, we may be a blessing for others, bringing the promise of the kingdom near by our words and our deeds. We pray these things in the name of the Holy Spirit, the Father, and the Son. Amen. And now shall we say the Lord's Prayer together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we
was when it was raining too hard for Dad to pitch our tent in the National Park, or if we were really lucky, the KOA, because they had showers and made the pool. And on those occasions, we got to stay in cheap roadside motels with names like Piney Acres or Creekside Vista. Bonus if they had that pool. Basically, if you've ever seen the movie National Lampoon's Vacation, you have seen a Raymond family outing. <laughs> the thing I remember most about our family trips, though, in the VW bus du jour, was that one of us kids was always whining the question that most exasperates every vacationing parent. Are we there yet? Every mom and dad has heard it. Every kid has said it. And every human being has felt it at one time or another. We're always impatient to get where we are going, and we can't just sit back and enjoy the ride. Our society seems to be suffering from an affliction that John Ortberg calls destination impatience. We rush through life always in a hurry, but where we are trying to get to so quickly, we can't really say. Ortberg relates a story about a late cardiologist named Meyer Friedman who coined the phrase hurry sickness to describe the frantic urge we humans have to get there. Regardless of the worry, preoccupation, and time poor life quality that our hectic effort produces in us. Friedman's upholsterer noticed an unusual wear pattern on the chairs in the doctor's waiting room. The fabric on them was worn out only on the very front edges. It was as if the people were literally sitting on the edge of their seats, even though they had nothing else to do at that moment but to wait for their appointment time with the good doctor. If you've ever been to a cardiologist, you know that's not usually a speedy endeavor. Are we there yet? <laughs> Clearly, something in us is waiting for something. Something good? Something different? Something better? Sometimes it just seems like we've been waiting around forever. In human terms, there's a word for it, especially for those of us who call ourselves Christians. The deepest and most mysterious expression of what we're waiting for is found in the amazing word eternity. In Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes excuse me, 3.11, we read that God has set eternity upon the human heart. We hold inside us this nagging sense that there is something more out there beyond the impermanence of this world. In 1 Peter 1.24, we read, Our flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away. Yet God has set eternity upon the human heart. Are we there yet? We tend to think of eternity as an endless, endless duration of time. However, Jesus never spoke about eternity in that way. In the whole New Testament, in, in fact, eternal life is defined only once. And as Ortberg says, with great precision, and in a way that has been largely lost in our day. John 17 in the NRSV says, This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life, in other words, is knowing God. Think about that. Eternal life is knowing God. Notice here that Jesus does not say they may know about you or that they might affirm some facts about you. No, he says that they may know you. This is an important distinction. Philosophers across time have differentiated between knowledge by description and knowledge by acquaintance. Now, here's an example of what I mean. Take the Raymond family outings that I mentioned at the outset of the sermon. 
I could tell you all about them. Really, I could tell you all about them. <laughs> the places we went together, the experiences we had, things we learned about nature and history at the many places we visited. I can tell you about camping. I can describe our peculiar state of the art in 1969, alpine six-man tent designed to endure high winds, but that was notoriously difficult to set up if you didn't know how, and that let in all the nighttime condensation or rain if your sleeping bag accidentally touched the wall during the night. I can describe to you the evening that we hurriedly ate half-cooked cracked macaroni and cheese, peas, mixed in mm, at the Metcalf Bottoms picnic area in the Smoky Mountains National Park because a mama black bear and her cubs were foraging for picnic scraps uncomfortably nearby right after my mom had already started cooking her dinner on the Coleman stove set up on a picnic table. But I know in a way that you all never can. And no matter how well I describe it to you, how the canvas of that old tent smelled when you first unzipped it after it sat zipped up all afternoon in the hot sun, only I know exactly how it felt to wake up with cold, wet feet inside my otherwise dry, green, flannel-lined sleeping bag. Only I know the crunchy taste of half-cooked mac and cheese with, mixed with cold peas and melted with the aroma of wood smoke. Only I see the look of panic in my mother's eyes when she saw the bears ambling about near the place my little brother was playing in the dirt with sticks and matchbox cars. Only I know the fear I felt in the pit of my 13-year-old stomach as we rushed to break camp and load the food box, the hot stove, the small children, and even the trash back into the well-worn yellow and white VW. Only I can feel the relief as the putt-putt of the bus's engine vibrated us out of that dusky, shadow-filled picnic area and back onto the asphalt parkway headed toward the relative safety of our campground. You see, knowledge by description can only go so far. Knowledge by acquaintance, knowledge by acquaintance goes much, much deeper because it is interactive, participatory, and experiential. Eternal life is the kind of knowing God that is an interactive relationship impossible to fully describe unless one experiences for oneself God's presence and favor in one's own real life on this earth. To know God, Orkberg says, is to live in rich, moment-by-moment, gratitude-soaked, participatory life together. To know God means we are never alone, never on our own. To know God means that we actually experience ourselves in moments of rejection and discouragement as God's beloved friend. Not because of anything good we have done or ever could do, but because of God's amazing grace. To know God means to know what Paul calls in Philippians 3.10, the power of his resurrection. Amongst and despite the details, tasks, and challenges of our daily, ordinary lives, what Paul describes, this eternal life, it isn't something far, far away, somewhere off there, out there in the great beyond, beyond the stars, that we can only hope to experience and enjoy after we pass on from this earthly life. It isn't simply about being able to give all the right answers in church, or in Bible study, or at our confirmation. It's not about affirming the right doctrines, quoting the right Bible verses, saying the right prayers, or achieving the minimum entrance requirements that will allow us to cross over the bridge and to get into heaven. No, my friends, it is much, much bigger and far more breathtaking than that. This is the good news. This is the breathtaking gospel that 
that Jesus preached. This eternal kind of life is not reserved for the very few and for the future. This kind of an amazing eternal life is available to everyone, everyone of God's children right now by God's grace and through Jesus forever and beyond death. It's not just out there. It's here. Ortberg's good friend, Dallas Willard, said that eternal life in the individual does not begin after death, but at the point where God touches the individual with redeeming grace and draws them into a life interactive with himself and his kingdom. Willard's words echo a sign that Ortberg has hanging on his office wall, across from his desk, that he looks at first thing every morning. In big block letters, it says, eternity is now in session. God is not waiting for eternity to begin someday. God lives in it right now. And in fact, this interactive fellowship full of joy and delight that exists between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is already rolling along. And we're invited to step into it to be a part of it right now. It may sound to some too amazing to be true, but the wonderful creator of the universe designed us to be in real, intimate relationship and friendship with him each and every day. People think, well, yeah, I'm supposed to be in relationship with God, but what I actually experience is having to obey him or having to serve him. I'm supposed to believe certain doctrines and things about God or experience things in a certain way. I'm supposed to go to a certain church, read a particular version of the Bible. I'm supposed to do good stuff and give my money and time. And to some extent, some of that is true. Most of that is true. But above, but above all of that, God just wants to be in relationship with you, with us. He wants to live in partnership with us, with you. He wants to be your friend. That is why the psalmist writes, for the Lord is my shepherd. That's not just a pretty saying. It's a picture of how God wants to be in friendship with us, how he wants to live with us. Even when things get hard, and even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't have to be afraid. We have nothing to fear because our good friend and powerful protector is with us all the time, if we allow him to be. But we have to believe that in our very hearts. So as we walk through this life full of peril and the eventuality of pain that we all experience, we have much to wait for and to look forward to. Are we there yet? No, not yet. Of this life and our hope for a better future, Ortberg writes this, death still robs us of, us of those we love. Children still go hungry. Refugees have no place to live. We lose our jobs, or our dreams, or our loved ones. Our bodies age and decay. Every day when I look in the mirror, I'm reminded I'm not there yet. Paul wrote that creation itself is groaning for the day when it will be liberated from its bondage to decay. That's from Romans 8.21. Amazingly, even the Spirit of God groans for this. Verse 26. To anyone who wonders, along with the old neurotic Jack Nicholson movie character, what if this is as good as it gets? Paul says that not only we, but all creation will one day taste the freedom and the glory of the children of God. What would become of us, asked John Calvin, if we did not take our stand on hope? But in some sense, we are there all. Or to be more precise, there, or there, whatever there is, there has come 
here. In the middle of our discomfort, discord, and suffering, eternal life slipped in the back door of our temporal reality through the birth of a tiny baby who grew up to become the carpenter of Nazareth, a friend who came to us amidst all our brokenness, disappointment, and decay, a sustainer who walks beside us in the midst of our loneliness and who will not let us go. Eternity has invaded time. Life in God's presence and power came here. No one knows yet how deeply humanity can enter into the peace and love and eternity. But each of us, is invited to enter in and to make our life a great experiment in the adventure. Of course, no human being has shared and experienced an intimate, loving friendship with God like the one Jesus had with his father. And it wasn't a hardship for him. He didn't roll out of bed each morning and worry about how he was going to please God today. What good deed was he going to do, or what good word was he going to say to make his father happy with him now? Instead, everything in Jesus' life flowed out of that relationship between them. But here's the key to all of that. Jesus didn't come just so that he could experience that. Jesus came to make it possible for each of us to also be an intimate friend of God's. That good news we keep talking about. This intimate friendship with God is what Jesus called discipleship. Now this is an important word, and it was precious to Jesus, but it's lost much of its meaning over time. It is increasingly, or interesting, sorry, to note that Jesus never told anybody, hey, here's what you need to do to become a Christian. He never defines or describes what a Christian is. Remember that Jesus himself was actually a devout Jew. In fact, the word Christian only appears in the New Testament three times, and only after Jesus' followers became so ethnically diverse that they could no longer be considered solely a sect within Judaism. Jesus never said to his friends, go into all the world and make everybody a Christian. But he did say, go and make everybody a disciple. By contrast, the Bible uses the word disciple 269 times. Dallas Willard wrote that the New Testament is a book about disciples, by disciples, and for disciples of Jesus Christ. Discipleship is not achieved by saying a one-time prayer, signing on a dotted line, uh, and you're in, I guess. It's not about a transactional arrangement, checking the right boxes or memorizing the right Bible verses so you can pass the big entrance exam in theology to get into heaven after you die because you believe all the right stuff. Not that that's not a great pursuit. I enjoyed it immensely. Discipleship is a way. Jesus' followers were often called the people of the way. A lifelong way along the journey of live, learning to live the life that Jesus offers. Historically, the way of describing that journey involved a series of stages. We'll explore these stages over the next few weeks. And Maybe stages isn't quite the right word because they're not really totally linear. We can go back and forth between them throughout our life spent in the company of Jesus. But really they're dynamics, I guess, that describe the way God is at work in our lives. So first we'll explore awakening. And this is when we wake up to the discovery that God is extraordinarily present in our ordinary days full of love and gratitude. Next, we'll take a look at something called purgation, which is a fancy old-fashioned word for really revealing all the junked up and gunked up stuff that clogs us up and prevents us from living our fullest lives and keeps God at arm's length from us. And then we'll examine how to identify, confess, and liberate ourselves from those things. 
Following that, we'll see how illumination causes us to begin to change at the level of our automatic perceptions and beliefs. We'll begin to see things the way Jesus sees them. And then we can really begin to live into that eternity that is now. And finally, we'll explore the idea of union. And this is the dynamic that describes the experience of the life that Jesus invites us into when he says, abide in me, and I will abide in you. Jesus' presence becomes an experienced reality rather than just an idea. It becomes an acquaintance rather than a description. Are we there yet? No, not hardly. But we're getting there. I hope you're ready to take this journey with me as we explore how to live the life of eternity up there that is available to us now under God's reign and his power down here. For the sake of the world, jump into the VW bus with me and let's keep going. Amen. <coughs>
set uh, plates for you to place your envelopes will be available on the chairs before you go out of the doors, or you may put it in the U.S. mail, bring it in during office hours, or use the online giving option. But however you choose to give, please know how much it is appreciated by the church, by our church leadership, and especially by me. Thank you very much. We have the means to give. We have the reason to give, Lord. And there are many of us waiting to give. Yet often our hands hold back and we hoard what we have for ourselves. God of grace, help us live and give in your kingdom of love, where there are no enemies, only brothers and sisters. And kindness is the air we breathe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now rise as you are able for the singing of the doxology, number 94. to God's love in the world, go knowing that God goes with you, sharing the laughter and the hope, the fears and the tears. Thanks be to God. 